it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Janet Guthrie. I'm general manager of the Hemp Hill County Groundwater District, located in the Texas Panhandle on the eastern side. But our first speaker today for you is going to be Virginia Palacios. Did I? Palacios. <laughs> Yes, so Virginia is the founder and executive director of Commission Shift. This is a nonpartisan advocacy organization building public support to reform oil and gas oversight in Texas through accountability at the Railroad Commission, our state, and oil and gas agency. Lady, it's all yours. Hey y'all, thanks for joining me today. Um, so my name is Virginia Palacios. Um, I, yeah, I do this work because, uh, you know, I'm also a land and mineral owner in South Texas. I'm a fourth generation land and mineral owner in Webb County, but uh, I'm also a ninth generation descendant of the founders of Laredo. Laredo has been around for just over uh, 265 years. And I think it's important to think about the time scales of the kinds of decisions that we're making and how it's going to impact future generations. Oil and gas development has only been around for about 130 years in Texas. And so every decision that we make today for our water, we gotta be thinking far ahead into our future of what it's gonna do. I wrote a report in 2021 when we launched Commission Shift, um, or sorry, uh, we launched Commission Shift with our first report on orphan wells in 2021, but I co-wrote a report in 2022 with Megan Milliken Biven called Eliminating Orphaned Wells and Sites in Texas. And this is a toolkit of 10 things that the Railroad Commission and the Texas Legislature can do to deal with the orphaned well problem in Texas. And so we're gonna be talking about just a couple of those solutions today because it gets deep and there are a lot of things that we can do actually. So our mission at Commission Shift is reforming oil and gas oversight in Texas, um, primarily through accountability at the Railroad Commission of Texas. And we have four main programs. The first is basic education about the Railroad Commission. The next is cleaning up oil and gas, uh, fixing the structure of the commission, including conflicts of interest and public accessibility. Um, and finally, energy costs, particularly related to winter storm URI and securitization. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about different definitions of unplugged wells in Texas, not only orphaned wells, um, and where they're located in Texas. Then we'll talk about uh, what operators are required to do by the Railroad Commission of Texas to fully retire their assets, so well plugging and site cleanup. And I'll talk about our two favorite solutions, which are reducing inactive well plugging extensions and also updating financial assurance requirements. And we're advocating for full cost bonding with a sinking trust fund. And then finally, uh, you know, the topic we've all been waiting for is about P13 wells. And so we'll have a discussion about that. And we'll ask y'all if you're interested to join our working group on P13 wells. And if we have any time, uh, we can talk about the federal infrastructure funds. So first is orphaned wells. Orphaned wells are wells that have no active operator and are unplugged, and it becomes the Railroad Commission's responsibility to plug those wells. This is a, a photo of a blowout from 2019 down in Refurio County. This was on Molly Rook's property. Her dad had been after the Railroad Commission for years to plug the orphaned wells on their land, and the commission never got to it. When he passed away, Molly inherited the problem. And uh, you know she also was after the Railroad Commission to plug these wells. And they didn't get to it before this blowout happened. And so this is really a multi-generational problem. You know We're seeing these orphan wells getting passed down to the next generation. And we got to make sure that we don't keep doing that. Inactive wells are not orphaned wells, but they are unplugged wells that do have an active operator on file, and that active operator is responsible for plugging those wells and paying for that plugging and cleanup. And so for an inactive well, we're talking about any well that has been inactive for more than 12 months. This uh, particular photo was from Antina Cattle Company. This is a ranch on the border of Ward and Crane Counties. Uh, these wells are old Chevron wells that started blowing out. They've been plugging these wells and they say it's like playing whack-a-mole. They'll plug one and another one will start leaking. 
This is a map of all the orphan wells by county in Texas. You'll notice a hot spot out in uh, Pecos County in West Texas, out in East County in Nacogdoches, up in the Panhandle in Hutchinson County. Um, and then the most recent hot spot is uh, over here in San Antonio area. A company called Petrosaurus has about 620 orphan wells on the list right now uh, down in Central Texas. And so right now there's close to 8,000 orphaned wells on the list. Uh, the railroad plugs about, railroad commission plugs on average 1,300 wells per year, but they are uh, increasingly plugging fewer wells per year and they're getting fewer state funds to be able to plug those wells. So, uh, you know, in the next biennium they'll plug 1,000 wells per year with state funds and 1,000 to 1,100 wells per year with federal funds for a total of 2,100 wells a year. And all of this data that you see is from Railroad Commission of Texas. By the way, if you go to our maps that we have on our website uh, and click into the map onto Esri, you can play with the layers, and I have layers on there for Senate districts and House districts and things like that. Um, this is the map of all the inactive unplugged wells in Texas. And I'm showing you this because it's really important to consider the population that the orphaned wells are coming from. Um, all of these inactive unplugged wells, some of those, some portion of those will eventually be orphaned. Um, and right now we know that operators are plugging an average of 7,700 inactive wells per year. That's more, more wells than the Railroad Commission plugs out of the orphaned well population. But at this rate, it would take 20 years to plug all of the inactive and shut-in wells in Texas. Out of the inactive wells population, which is 13, 113,000, about 17,000 of those inactive wells have been inactive for at least 20 years. And then uh, another point on this is that we recently looked at all the inactive wells list and we found that about 5,000 of the wells on that list were owned by barred operators. These are operators that uh, lost their ability to operate in Texas. And we asked the Railroad Commission why these wells were not on the orphaned wells list and we have not gotten a response yet. And so we also produced a video series built off of the report that we published in 2022. And so y'all can check that out on YouTube. It's a five part video series. You could listen to it while you're driving. Um, but just three of the top solutions that uh, we're recommending is limiting these inactive well plugging extensions, making sure that we're collecting the right amount of financial assurance based on how much it actually costs to plug a well, and um, you know, modernizing our financial assurance tools. Bonding is not the, the only way to assure that these wells can be paid for in the future. And so now I'm just gonna talk you through like what does the Railroad Commission actually require here? Uh, well, you're supposed to plug wells within one year of drilling or operations ceasing, or you can go get a plugging extension. And if you do get plugging extensions, there are different requirements at year five, year 10, um, and beyond. And the last thing is, uh, you know, if, you're, if your well is more than 25 years old and it's been inactive for more than 10 years, then you gotta do a hydraulic pressure, or sorry, a fluid level test or a hydraulic pressure test. And so this is a, an example of some orphaned wells in the middle of the Brazos River. And then you see a situation where we, where we have equipment that has not yet been removed on the edge of the Brazos River. And the problem that they're having out here is that uh, that river edge is eroding away and that equipment could potentially fall into the river and cause problems. Okay, so now we're gonna have a little choose your own adventure. I'm gonna take you through a hypothetical example of how these inactive well plugging extensions work and the different options that oil and gas operators have to get those plugging extensions. And this is just to illustrate how the state has made it extremely inexpensive to get plugging extensions and to avoid the cost of asset retirement obligations. Okay, so imagine you're an oil and gas well operator. You've got 100 inactive wells. For the sake of this illustration, we're gonna assume that every well is 10,000 feet deep. Um, the Railroad Commission's actual average cost to plug across all districts in Texas is $10 per foot, um, but their average plugging depth, depth is only 4,000 feet. So some people say that that $10 per foot is not representative of how much it actually costs to plug deeper wells. Um, for the operator in this assumption, we're gonna assume that the operator can get a better economy of scale and that it will only cost them $8 a foot to plug. And so 
Out of the whole 100 well population, it would cost the Railroad Commission $100,000 per well and the operator $80,000 per well. Total cost would be $10 million for the Railroad Commission or $8 million for the operator. And so a blanket plugging extension is a plugging extension for all the entire population of wells, but extensions can also be given for individual wells, and we'll see that on the next slide. So if I'm applying for a blanket extension, I can either plug or reactivate 10% of my inactive well op population. I can file a copy of federal uh, accounting documents with the commission, or I can submit some additional financial security that is equal to the amount of the railroad commission's cost to plug or $2 million, whichever is less. And so you can see in these examples, um, the lowest cost option is that $2 million blanket bond, which would only cost the operator $60,000 for 100 wells. And then you compare that to the operator's actual cost to plug, which would be $8 million. So of course, you're going to go get a plugging extension. And so if I need to get an individual extension, there are more options. Um, I can submit a supplemental bond or a letter of credit or a cash deposit. I can pay some money into an escrow fund equal to the Railroad Commission's cost of plugging. I can pay a $50 per well fee and submit proof of a successful fluid test or hydro, hydraulic pressure test. And if, I'm, if I have an enhanced oil recovery project, I can further delay. The last option is that I can get a licensed professional engineer or a geoscientist to affirm that the well can be reasonably expected to produce economically in the future um, that is probably going to have a beneficial use. And so it's important to critique that last option because the data from the Railroad Commission shows that an average of 17 wells, 1,700 wells per year are actually reactivated. Um, and when you compare that to the total number of inactive wells in the state, it's just hardly anything. And so I think we really need to be questioning whether operators are, are in a meaningful way going to get back to these wells that we're granting plugging extensions to. Um, and another reason why this is important is because if you look at the orphaned well population, the Railroad Commission is taking on more orphaned wells every year than it plugs. And so those orphaned wells are coming from that big population of inactive wells that we keep giving plugging extensions to. And so, if all else fails and the operators uh, don't make good on their promise to eventually plug or reactivate a well, then the financial assurance is supposed to come into play. But the problem is that we're not collecting nearly enough of it. And so for an individual well, operators are only required to submit a $2 per foot bond. And that is in comparison to the Railroad Commission's $10 per foot cost to plug, actual cost to plug. Um, and, you know, this bond, just the illustration that you're seeing here on the screen is that, you know, the bond would be for a total amount of $20,000, but the operator only pays like a max 3% premium on it. If they have good credit, then they'll pay like a 0.75% premium on that bond. So the operator doesn't have to pay that much money um, in the end for this kind of financial assurance. Um, and the blanket bonds, so if you're bonding multiple wells, uh, you could do a blanket bond. In Texas statute, it's tiered based on the number of wells that you have. Um, and this is just an illustration of what the per well amount of bonding is that the Railroad Commission would be collecting under this law. And so you can see that it comes out to $2,500 or less in some situations, and then in other situations, a mere $500 per well. And so our solution is to have full cost bonding for every well, and you could combine this with a sinking trust fund. And so the concept here is that you would estimate the total cost of decommissioning, so cost of plugging and cleaning up the well site. Um, and then every year the operator would make a payment into a savings account that could only be used for eventual asset retirement obligation. And so they would make a payment into that account up to the total estimated cost of decommissioning. And while they're accruing funds in that account, they could pay a lower bond every year um, so that, uh, you know, because they won't need a full cost bond uh, later on after they've already accrued some savings. Okay. You guys ready to talk about P13s? <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, who's heard of Bomer Lake before? Beamer Lake, some folks call it. 
Yes, uh, this one's been in the news. So uh, Beamer Lake is formed from a well that is now referred to as a P13 well, even though when the well was drilled, that form P13 did not exist at the Railroad Commission. Um, but this is a well that is uh, uh, has formed a 60-acre saltwater lake in Pecos County. It's uh, flowing at a rate of about 400 gallons per minute. It has high rates of uh, radionuclides and hydrogen sulfides, and it is four times saltier than the ocean. P13 wells, as uh, you can see on the slide, are originally permitted by the Railroad Commission as oil and gas wells. But if they end up being dry holes or they eventually become inactive, they can be transferred to landowners as water wells. Um, and so this is an example of another uh, issue that was created by a P13 well. This is the sinkhole on FM 1053. Um, and Skylar White uh, owns part of that land where that sinkhole exists. He's here today. The sinkhole is the diameter of five football fields. Uh, Every time it rains, the road tends to open up, and so TxDOT is talking about spending uh, 27 to $35 million to reroute the road at this point. And this is important because the Railroad Commission has about $300 million from the federal government coming its way to plug orphaned wells in Texas, but it has chosen not to include P13 wells in its definition of orphaned wells. And we'll talk more about that definition in a second. But we need a solution to be able to deal with these P13 wells if the Railroad Commission won't do it. In the short term, we need some funding to deal with these major disaster sites like Beamer Lake or the sinkhole on FM 1053. Um, and in the long term, we need to figure out how to prevent operators from transferring these P13 wells just because they don't want to pay to plug and clean up the well, but knowing that this could cause bad problems for landowners later on down the road. The photo that you see on the screen right here is a well that Skyler tried to plug on his land to the tune of $200,000, and he wasn't able to finish plugging it. And so we can't expect landowners to be ponying up this kind of money to plug wells that operators dumped on them every time. Um, and so one thing is it, for the next legislative session for us to consider is a correct funding mechanism that will allow us to deal with problem P13 wells. And so I want to get back to this question of whether these P13 wells ought to be able to qualify as orphaned wells and ought to be able to qualify for that federal funding. So if you look at state law, an orphaned well is defined as a well for which the Railroad Commission has issued a permit a well that has uh, no current activity and that doesn't have an active operator. And P13 wells meet all three of those definitions. Uh, this is a snapshot of the form P13 from the Railroad Commission that executes that transfer. Um, and it says that the duty to properly plug the well ends only when the operator has um, successfully plugged the well up to the base of the usable quality water stratum. And so if that plug up to the base of usable quality water fails, then if the operator is no longer around, it ought to be able to be considered an orphaned well. And so you will see on the screen here a uh, QR code. If you're interested in talking through these issues of P13 dwells with us, uh, please sign up on this form to be a part of our working group on P13 dwells. These problems can be very complex and they're not easy to address either in law um, or through funding. And so we wanna get a group of experts together to help us talk about these issues and what the solutions could be. Um, there's my contact info. And I just wanted to give folks a little bit of time for questions. And if there are no questions, I have bonus slides. So. <laughs> Very good. Are there any questions? So I'll ask you a question. So have you had any success or any interested parties on the legislative side of taking some of your suggestions and resolutions? You know, I think there's interest, but I think there's also fear of what Texogo will think, of what TIPRO will think, of what um, Texas Alliance of Energy Producers will think. And so, um, you know, we have a structure in the state of Texas where, um, you know, the oil and gas industry is funding a lot of campaigns, and it's difficult for lawmakers to say, well, you know, we're going to make folks pay for what they said they would pay for if uh, those folks are funding their campaigns and saying, no, we don't want to pay anything. 
And so um, I think you know, there are operators who are responsible and want to do the right thing. And so we need to hear more from those operators so that we can protect our groundwater. Are you sure there's no other questions? Because I have another one. I got one over here on the right. Yes. Can you go to the microphone, please? So it's recorded, please. Thank you. I guess it's not on. <laughs> Uh, has the Railroad Commission addressed any of the concerns that you've brought up? Um, well, they disagree that P13 dwells are orphaned dwells. They have fought hard on that issue. Um, I think they... Uh, I think they are minimizing the problem because it looks bad. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more wells uh, leaking that are inactive wells that still have active operators or that are orphaned wells. And, you know, I will give the commission credit. Like, they do have a good orphaned well plugging program compared to other states. Like, most other states don't even have the kind of program that Texas has. And so even though we're only plugging an average of 1,300 wells per year, and in the next biennium, the state will only pay to plug 1,000 wells per year, um, and that's not enough. It's still much, much better than what other states are doing. And so we could take that program and enhance it, right? But the real problem is that we got to change the statutes that allow unlimited inactive well plugging extensions and make it really easy for operators to get those plugging extensions. So it really does take the Texas legislature addressing this problem. And the bonding requirements are also in statute. So the Railroad Commission can't really adjust the bonding requirements without the legislature. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the uh, uh, increased injection pressures and the problem uh, with the, the amount of water that the oil companies need to move and how that's uh, uh, exacerbating the orphan well problem? And also the uh, uh, wells that were previously plugged, the, where the plugs are failing. <laughs> Right, and so the class two injection wells that take uh, produced water for disposal, uh, you know, in, the, in 2021, the Railroad Commission said that they permitted about 400 wells in class two injection wells in the Permian Basin out of 600 statewide. Um, and around the same time period, you know, we've seen a lot of these blowouts and leaks in the Permian Basin. And so, um, there's a lot of connectivity between where we're injecting into class two wells, I think, um, and some of these unplugged wells through whether they're orphaned wells or inactive wells. Um, and your second question, Skylar, was about uh, leaking wells that are starting to um, appear. Oh, wells that were not properly plugged. Yeah, and so the, the other thing that we've found, we've started to see is that um, there are wells that were documented as having been plugged, but folks are going out and finding that there was never a legitimate plug in the first place. Like maybe the well was sealed or capped with a piece of metal at the top, but there, it was never cemented all the way through. Um, and so these are real threats to our groundwater in the future. And another reason why these are going to be a large concern in the future is because the Railroad Commission is applying for what's called primacy from the EPA so that they can have uh, regulatory and permitting authority over a new type of injection well. And that type of injection well is called a class six carbon dioxide injection well. And so uh, there's a new structure, right, where folks are planning to capture carbon dioxide from power, point, power plants or directly from the air, and then pipe that carbon dioxide uh, to an injection well and inject it underground. And well, if there are a lot of unplugged wells that we don't know about or wells that we think are plugged that were never properly plugged and we have communication with those injection zones, then we might see that uh, carbon dioxide coming right back out. But the other problem is that when carbon dioxide mixes with water, it forms carbonic acid. And we've heard testimony from some operators who say that that acid can be extremely strong. Um, there was a guy who testified this session who said that he drilled through a carbonic acid zone knowing that it was there and preparing for it. And in a matter of 12 hours, it ate all the way through his five inch heavy duty drill bit. Um, and so this is a real threat to our aquifers if we don't reform the standards at the Railroad Commission. One last question for you real quick. Getting back to the numbers that you had of your inactive wells, and then 
you made the point that a lot of those inactive wells are in the future becoming orphaned wells, and the number of orphaned wells are exceeding the number of wells that are being plugged on an annual basis. However, if you change the definition or move up that in transition, are you not even further overwhelming the Railroad Commission and the fiscal note that would be attached to truly addressing it? So is it really a classification issue? Or is it truly a funding, staffing, just the mechanics of addressing the big issue? Yeah, well, I think this is why it's so important to make sure that private companies that are profiting from the kind of extraction that they're doing are the ones paying for the wells to be plugged. Like it, right now, the way rail, the Railroad Commission pays for orphaned well plugging is by collecting fees and surcharges from the industry, and to a very small extent, as you saw, the bonds that, are, that they're required to collect. Um, and so the industry is paying for that orphaned well plugging program, um, but you know, as we mentioned, it would, it's, we're not keeping pace with the number of orphan wells that are coming onto the list. And so, um, yeah, it's gonna increase the fiscal note to the state to be able to manage that. The Railroad Commission provides a cost estimate in its orphaned wells list of how much it would cost to plug all of those orphaned wells, and that totals up to about $8 billion. Um, and that's just the wells that are on the list now, and they're always adding more every year. And so some folks have estimated the total cost of plugging all the wells in the state of Texas, whether they're active or orphaned or inactive, um, at uh, about $100 billion. And we have less than 1% of that collected in the, by the state in bonds. Less than 1% of a $100 billion note in plugging and site remediation. And so we are setting ourselves up for taxpayers to potentially end up having to pay for that more and more. I mean, right now, those federal funds that are coming from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, those are taxpayer dollars. Like, are we gonna keep doing that to foot the bill for companies that are profiting now? Okay, thank you, Virginia. Will you please give her a nice... Yeah. Thank you.